Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Kansas Community College. And I'm really excited to welcome you here today. It's, it's wonderful to see all the posters and to read some of the titles of things of the research that you've done, so it's just very exciting. You know, when I dressed this morning, I think I forgot what I was going to be doing today, but as I was thinking about it, I thought I'd maybe look a little more like a professor than an administrator, so I know Amy Tony Hooker didn't agree with me or not. Uh, today marks the college's inaugural foray into hosting a research symposium in psychological science. After two years in a pandemic, it's really thrilling to see this many people gathered here today. So thank you for coming. It's one of my first uh, experiences with a group this size, really in two years. So it's just it's a very exciting day for us, for many reasons. Uh, as you know, psychological science is at the cutting edge of new and exciting discoveries in the human Psychological scientists seek to describe, understand, explain that human behavior and those mental processes. They also have goals predicting and influencing specific behaviors. Critical to the process of discovery is research. Through participation in this symposium, uh, students here today have, will develop research and technology skills, create research-based posters, network among scholars and colleagues, and enhance some of those soft skills such as interpersonal communication and an opportunity to talk about the research that you're doing. So this is just a very exciting day for me and I think for you. Um, research has shown that the earlier in one's academic career an individual is introduced to scientific research or psychological research, the higher the probability of becoming more involved in and developing an appreciation for research. Community College is an excellent beginning place. It is here that one can begin a journey to understand and value research, both for its results, but also for the process of research. Community Colleges provide a bridge between simply studying psychology and beginning the process of psychological research and perhaps creating or discovering new knowledge. Intrinsic to this early on process is not only doing the research, but presenting it in a public scholarly form like you're doing today. A form not only including your instructors, but also other psychological scientists. A form not so much geared towards a grade, so we sometimes get value in our courses, but a form to experience that added value of being evaluated by other scholars and to share the work of other scholars. The goals of this research symposium psychological science are threefold to introduce and encourage the lively exploration of psychological science research among students to connect students to the world of research in psychological science and to provide a conduit for students to engage other research scholars in the field of psychological science especially students in your age cohort. so please accept my warmest welcome to kansas city kansas community college and I hope you have a wonderful, fruitful day. Thank you. All right. Can we learn some already? Yeah? Yes. Hey, I wanted to take a quick minute to um, honor some, some special guests we have here. Um, we have today uh, one of our board of trustees, Trustee Sutton. Would you thank you for coming today? Yes. A doctor from one of the universities. Uh, what's your stand? And I'm going to welcome you guys here on campus. Yes, Dr. Rizzo. All right, we also have our wonderful Casey KCC faculty. Um, we have our Dean of Social Sciences and Public, which is a board for that. Um, and then we have our uh, psychology coordinator, uh, Mr. Antonio. Um, and then we have Dr. Nair, undergraduate. And then we have Ms. Stacey Tucker, Dr. Stacey Tucker. She's our undergraduate um, in our undergraduate department as well. And there's a doctor, Amanda Williams. Um, she's also helping with that. So anyway, we've got some great staff. And Michael, oh, she forgot about Michael. Michael, we were there, yes. All right, again, um, thanks for coming here. And let's, let's put our thinking caps on because we're about to get into this. So I'm gonna welcome one of our students um, who's going to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. 
uh, Mr. Guillerme of Hungary. And I still need to last name, but come on up, Guillerme. Good morning, everyone. Um, Dr. Marin Leon Barajas was born and raised in Kansas City. She graduated from Turner High School, Turner High School in 2007 and attended Kansas City Kansas Community College in 2008 and 2009. Prior to transferring to Park University, where she completed her bachelor's degree in psychology from Park University in 2011. Inspired by her clients with whom she worked as a direct support professional, group home manager, and case manager in a human service setting, she returned to school and earned her master's degree in applied behavioral science in, 20, in 2018, and doctoral degree in 2021 in behavioral psychology from the University of Kansas. While in graduate school, she gained additional experience as a behavioral analyst, working with adults with developmental disabilities, children with autism, school-aged children, and young adults with severe problem behavior, and per performance management. Marin is currently a senior behavioral analyst at Neuro, Neuro Restorative Kansas, where she is growing a home and community based Program that focuses on improving the lives of brain injured survivors. Marin's current interests include mentoring high school and college students interested in psychology, improving the educational experience and workplace conditions for DI POC. So this morning, um, I have the opportunity to present my um, keynote called Discovering Your North Star, A Dream to Living Your Values. Okay, so a couple of learning objectives for this morning. Um, we're just going to learn to describe how identities and histories can um, provide context for identifying our values. We're going to learn to describe values and what values are, what they're not. Describe strategies to use to get back on track when values, um, you know, are aren't able to be seen anymore. Sometimes we lose track of them in our studies, especially with students, um, especially working students. And I think of returning ones. Some of y'all have children, um, so sometimes we lose track of those. And so we're going to talk about some strategies to get back on track once we lose sight of those. And describing um, the application values to real life scenarios. So on the right here, you see um, a sort of graphic depiction of several identities. It's not a complete list of all of our identities, but it's a good general um, list of them. And so as you sort of look at this, um, think of what what categories you fit into um, with respect to ethnicity, um, age, and things of that nature. 
So for me, um, I'll tell you that I'm navigating this world as a Hispanic female. I'm 33 years old. I'm heterosexual. I have anxiety and ADHD. I'm a Mexican American. I'm from the middle class and I identify as a Christian. So these identities of mine give me a unique perspective that's only mine, right? So you all also have your own identities that give you a unique perspective that only you have. Um, it also kind of gives us an idea of how the world sees us, right? So who are y'all? I want to know. Um, I've got some exercises if you're able to um, participate on your phones. Um, so you'll see a poll here. Um, and if you go to www.menti.com and enter this code, make sure y'all are able to see that. So if it's too small, I'm going to read it off here in just a couple of seconds, give everyone a chance to get to the website. So the code that you enter is 8374-7813. And it should bring you to a site that's going to allow you to participate in a poll. And so the poll is asking to select your race or ethnicity, select all that apply. And as you start to respond, we're going to see live responses pop up. So I'm going to say that number again. The code to enter is 8374-7813. Give Okay. Sorry, I know you'll have to sign in to participate. So if, if you're able to simply make an account, I feel like mine's relatively easy. Um, but I would love for us to be able to do some of this. Also, tech um, having an added issue. Is anyone able to help with that? Maybe I can do hand raising. Is that easier? Okay, let me try this. By a show of hands, how many of y'all want to participate by raising your hands while asking yes no questions versus making the account? So that percentage is, I feel like that's a relatively decent amount of folks. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask some yes no questions alternatively. I apologize for the inconvenient tech stuff. Um, so if you identify as Asian, and remember that you can raise your hand multiple times. Um, so if you identify as Asian, raise your hand. Awesome. If you identify as Black or African American, please raise your hand. Latino or Hispanic? Native American? Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander? And white. Okay. So, y'all know this. Hello? Okay. Okay. Um, so, if you all noticed, um, there's quite a diverse group of you here, which is really exciting. Hello? Okay. I'm not as me and not anyone else, okay? <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. 
Um, okay, so I just wanted to sort of point out the diversity among the group. Um, and the point of that also is to, some of you might notice that you are an extreme minority um, in some of these categories. Others notice maybe you're among peers more than you thought before. So um, an additional um, poll that I was going to do, and I'll kind of modify this for the purposes of time. Um, so I was going to have you all um, kind of describe the different abilities that you have. Um, so I'm just going to do um, kind of as a group, um, you either identify as having a disability or not have it, I'm sorry, having a disability and it could be physical, neurological, sensory, it could be in any of these categories, if I can't see. Um, intellectual, developmental, it could be any of those items um, versus you don't know that you have a disability at all. So those of you that have a disability, please raise your hand if you're comfortable. And those of you who do not, so um, navigating the world as someone with a disability is difficult and challenging. It presents things that, um, again, only you experience, and sometimes you feel really alone in those instances. But um, the purpose of this is kind of to see you do have community, however small. The second thing I'd like folks to consider when thinking about your values in life is your history. So consider your cultural upbringing. Um, consider your histories of reinforcement. Consider observational learning. So as a Mexican-American um, female and young child, for example, when I was younger, my voice was not going to be heard no matter how loud I spoke. Um, it should not be heard because I shouldn't speak in the first place at times. Um, and I was expected to kind of grow up, get married, have children, be at home, probably not work, um, and do a lot of things that are very like traditional in my personal family. And that's different from your experiences. So this context of our identities and our histories kind of set that context for us to be able to identify where our values are and why. So there's no way for me to possibly cover my entire history and what brought me to this point in things, but I thought it would be kind of fun to go through um, bits and pieces of it based on the schools that I went to and what kinds of things were occurring when I was in those schools. So <clears throat> I went to Casey KCC, and um, I'm just going to kind of discuss a couple pivotal experiences, um, my main ones for each school. And so um, as I just this morning heard, um, a lady came up to Mr. Ammons, my old side teacher, um, and she said, I remember you, and you were my favorite teacher. And in that moment, I knew I was not alone. <laughs> um, so at um, KCKCC, I would consider my most pivotal experience being meeting Mr. Ammons. Um, and then in 2007, and he, you know, I come to class the first time, I'm in Psych 101, I'm very young. Um, and I'm you know, coming with my iPod and my earbud bin, and I sit down, and he starts to pass out this like book of a syllabus, right? <laughs> and it's like bright pink. Um, I feel like some of y'all can relate to this. Raise your hand if you have Mr. Ammons. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Bear with me. So. Getting that syllabus, I thought to myself, I'm never going to survive college. <laughs> I'm going to have to read 30 page syllabi and do all the things that are in there. So I start to read this syllabus, right? And it explicitly states every single thing that I could possibly need to expect is going to happen this semester. And I was able to plan for my homework, plan for those quizzes. I got feedback on my, on my grading and things. It was amazing. It was just an eye-opening experience. Um, he also taught planning skills, and I use a variation of those planning skills today. So does he still use the calendar? Yeah. Who, who you're studying with, what you're studying, when you're studying. Yes, okay. So that was really important for me too because that was the onset of my organizational skills as an adult. <laughs> so shout out to Mr. Ammons, thank you so much. Um, but representation matters, guys, and this is another thing that 
really hit home with me. I don't think that I knew it back then, but I know it now because I'm standing in front of you here today. Um, and he really just helped me believe in myself. So, again, thank you, Mr. Ammons. <laughs> he had no idea I was going to bring much data. So, um, from KCK, I transferred to Park University to finish my bachelor's degree in psychology. Another incredible experience. So, I took a field placement class there. That wasn't really a class, right? I had to go get a real job in like, the field of psychology. And another, another point in time, I thought, I'm never going to survive this. I have to work in the field before I'm ready to work in my field. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And, but it was another pivotal experience for me because I got to um, the human service setting that I worked at for several years. And um, I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to get pinched and slapped and punched and all kinds of things. <laughs> These adults with intellectual disabilities who have really not quite the understanding that you and I do. So um, I ended up falling in love with the field and um, I was there for 11 years. 11 years. So um, that was something that just entirely changed my life. Finally, I went to the University of Kansas. Um, also, Bob Chaw and Tina Chan. So, after about four years in the field, I finally decided to go back for my master's and doctoral degrees. And um, I got into the University of Kansas doctoral program in applied behavioral science. Um, and I did my research and clinical experiences there. Um, I got all kinds of experiences. I had clinical experience before because, like I said, I was doing questions and things like that um, over before that ever happened. <laughs> um, but um, I was able to do research with kids with autism, and um, those kids with autism had feeding issues. They had um, issues where they would only play with one choice, and we were teaching them to play with more choice, not just kind of line the trains up kind of thing. She's a very typical example, I guess. Um, I got experience um, working with truancy, um, truancy for juvenile delinquents, collaborating on some programs for that. Um, staff performance in the human service setting, so working with staff to improve their workplace environment and improve their workplace conditions. Um, and also adherence to math protocols, so I did a study on um, staff working with individuals with intellectual disabilities wearing their masks in the COVID pandemic. I'm like, how cool is that? Like, you get to affect the world with this stuff, guys. Like, research is amazing. It's an amazing tool. And so it was really at KU that I started to appreciate um, the rich potential of how I could affect the whole field. And the field can affect the whole world. So all of this to say, um, identities and history are part of, again, how we develop our values, how we decide our values, things like that in the church. So I want you to consider three questions when you think about values. What matters to you? What do you wake up in the morning thinking about? What do you, um, what effect do you want to have on the people around you? What guides your everyday behavior? Again, kind of, what in every moment of every day, what are you really striving for? And what do you want your life to be about? At the end of you know our 60, 80, 100 years, if we're lucky, right? We want to leave our mark on the world. And research is one way to kind of do that, right? Values are chosen. So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of what they are, what they're not, so they're just clear goals and values are different. So values are chosen. They're unique to you and only you. They're actions or qualities of actions. They're ways of being. So as far as what values are not, they're not results. They're not goals or specific actions. So it's not winning the NCAA, <laughs> NCAA championship. It's not getting your homework done tonight. Those are goals. And values are not dependent on others, so again, they're uniquely yours. Values are also applicable for research and school. They're applicable in your um, environment for working, school, relationships, 
and leisure. So values are kind of running in the background the entire time. That's why I call it the North Star. The North Star is always there. Whether we're paying attention to it or attending to it at all, that's up to us. So you encounter lots of barriers at times with respect to living out your values. A lot of those are listed here. I'm sure there are others, but my main ones I wanted to kind of talk about today, especially for students, um, is time, money, and motivation. So time, y'all are busy, probably work, maybe multiple jobs, and that's always competing with being able to do what you want to do at school, what you want to do with your relationships, and what you want to do in your leisure time, if you have any. Um, money can affect if you want your values to be something like giving financially, but you don't have money, that's a barrier. And motivation, so lots of us say, you know, we're our, ourselves are our own worst enemies. So whether we wake up and we do what we want to be doing, what we want to be living, is our decision. And yeah, there are environmental factors that affect that all the time. But ultimately, in the long run, we think about values as something that just always exists and it's always on a sliding scale, but how close we are to living those out. So overcoming barriers, there's a couple strategies I like to suggest. Um, one of them is ongoing evaluation, feedback, and reinforcing close approximations. So what that might look like, and this is one tool I like to suggest, um, an acceptance and commitment therapist named Tobias Lundgren from Sweden developed this tool. And um, it sort of is a way to evaluate on a regular basis how close you are to living your values in each of those quadrants that you see up there. So work and education in that top left quadrant has to do with your work and educational goals. So it could be you know, making sure that you have time for homework all the time, things of that nature. Um, as far as the top right quadrant, leisure. So that could involve um, anything that you like to do in your free time. So like I personally like to read. Um, I like to hang out with my friend, I like to hang out with my husband, things like that. In the bottom left quadrant, there's personal growth and health. So it could involve like organized religion. It could involve um, you know, that gym pass that you've been trying to get for months and haven't had time to do it. Um, and relationships, so friends, family, coworkers, you can evaluate your, um, your values in each of those sections on a regular basis. The first time I did this exercise, it was my fifth year in grad school, so I was almost done, and I was like, oh, why didn't I know about this beforehand? And it's something that our advisor, um, my advisor um, encouraged us to do once a semester with her. And so um, faculty, I'm also talking to you, like, you can bring this up to your students. Um, but it's something that you can maybe do on a regular basis to make that difference in Acknowledging when you wake up in the morning what your goals are, what your values are, and how close you're living to them. Um, for anyone who's interested, I can also, it's easily found online, but it's called the Bullseye Exercise. Um, if you want to Google it, or I can provide it for folks who ask. So, as far as the barriers and addressing those big barriers, um, evaluation is really important for ongoing progress toward anything. So you constantly evaluate your how close you are. You know, I would say when I was in grad school, guys, my values for work education were probably you know about right there, maybe right here. Leisure, all the way out here, because you know not able to live any leisure time in <laughs> grad school sometimes. Um, my relationships were probably like right here. I was uh, my husband's not a very happy person. I was like, never home. You know, I basically came home to sleep for like six hours. And I was like, <laughs> And then um, for personal growth and health, you know, I always have this goal of going to the gym, um, you know, exercising, eating more healthy, but I was always getting McDonald's, like whatever's fast and easy. And so when you evaluate on a regular basis, you already know how close you are to living your values on at any given time, right? And once you do this once, you kind of start to think about it in this goal that exercise format. As far as feedback, um, I would say that the, the first time you do this can function as feedback for the second time that you do it. Because you can look back and say, have I made progress towards 
you know, making any of these check marks closer to that bullseye or balancing them out. Because maybe the goal isn't to have it right in the center for all of them. That's almost impossible. There's not enough time for day. <laughs> so maybe you have a check mark here for one, one aspect, but you have one that's at least relatively close, but not all the way up here. So striving for that balance all the time. Also, so let's say you're friends to provide feedback for you. So when you are um, completing things like this, or you know, you're waking up and you're like, gosh, why am I, what's my purpose here? What am I living for? You think about your values and tell your friends, these are what my values are. I want feedback about how you think I'm doing. Let's be a close friend, of course, but I don't know what you're doing in your spare time, those things. But asking for feedback will um, you know, help you grow in those ways. Finally, reinforcing close approximations. So this is just basically saying be kind to yourself. It's a very um, difficult balance to find. I only found my name a year ago, not really two, um, where I'm happy. I'm happy with where I'm living my values at this point. Um, be kind to yourself. Baby steps count. Any baby step toward the center of this bullseye exercise counts toward something really important. I was going to do another really fun activity. I'm so bummed this isn't working, to be honest. Um, so I maybe what I'll do to kind of um, make this one a little bit different so we can still participate, um, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand when I call out the, um, the category that applies to you as far as where you are living your values the closest currently today. So if you're living your values the closest, in the work and education realm, raise your hand. This is not you guys. If you're living your values closest to leisure, in leisure, um, raise your hand. I commend you all, okay? Because that is important. Take care of yourself. Can't, um, can't pour out of the empty cup, they say, right? Personal growth and health. Amazing. So more self-care. I love that. Good. And relationships. Decent amount. Could be some more. So um, just to kind of um, give an overall, I, I saw a large amount of people in the work education. I know I shouldn't, so that's to be expected, maybe. But I just wanted to kind of get you thinking, generating ideas about what you can do to live close to your values by identifying your history and your identities as part of that context to be able to identify those. So my personal values, really quickly, making a difference, community, and persistence. Um, my story is much longer than I have to talk, but they're really important to me, all three of them. Um, I'm gonna skip over this for the sake of time. But I did want to do a fun word cloud that I'm probably the most fun about. <laughs> so um, can y'all see that okay in the back? Give me a thumb. Okay. Thank you. So there's lots of values here listed. This is not a complete list, but it gives you some ideas. Um, I would love, and I know it's awkward, but like I would love if someone could raise their hand, maybe a handful of you, maybe three of you. Um, you can raise your hand and tell me uh, on this list what is the number one value that jumps out to you? What's, what's something that resonates with you? Yes, sir. Yes. Creativity. Okay, awesome. And you. I agree with that. Wonderful. So I was really hopeful that I was going to be able to show all these values to you all, and I was going to say what an awesome group you are. Even though I, I didn't get to hear from everyone, I just think you all are incredible. I hope that you were able to take some of the bits and pieces of this and sort of apply it to your life, apply it to your research. Think of if you apply your research, your values to your research, how much better it could be even. So hopefully you're living out your, your biggest dreams and values through research and in every other aspect of your life. Um, per my community um, 
value. I do want to give you all my email address in case there's any questions. Um, I'm happy to talk with any of you, and I do want to thank you for your time this morning. All right, and um, did you guys also remember that she is a Casey Casey's me alumni, right? <laughs> All right, um, and how do you guys love that thing about uh, uh, Victor? Your syllabus, your big big package, you guys still get your calendars. Hey, I was gonna tell you, um, uh, Victor has really uh, played uh, significant roles in lots of students' lives. Um, he actually had one of his students actually make, they made a song, they wrote a song, and he's in it. It's like a popular song. I don't know who the artist was, but she's like a hip-hop artist. Anyway, you all are going to have to say, find that song, and he did, he's in that song, by the way. The whole experience of KCK is actually in that song. So, anyway, so don't forget that. Okay, so next, thank you for the presentation, that was awesome, by the way. Um, the, and our next uh, speaker is going to be Dr. Anna Pope from the KU Edwards Psychology Lab. All campus. Um, you'll find that we have some information over there, so if you're interested in our campus, you can check it out later. Um, today I'm going to talk about some of the research that we do in my research lab, um, and I'm going to highlight the research that I do with my undergraduate students who are actually here with me today to present. So over in that corner, when we're done and we're at the posters, you can check out that research as well. So hopefully that is helpful and informative. And I'm also going to tell you, this is my first time ever using a handheld microphone, so if I go in and out, you can just yell at me a little, and I'll learn to hold it a little bit better. <laughs> All right, so I have quite a few different topics to go over today, so I'm going to move relatively quickly. Um, I want to say thank you to our previous speaker for talking about values, because values matter a lot in the type of research I do, because my research is mostly in the world of diversity and inclusion, and my background is being a prejudice researcher, and a lot of the research I've done on prejudice, I find values and morals to be a good descriptive factor to better understand group differences and differences in values, so I thank you for that, for the introduction here. So today I'm going to talk about one specific thing, and my focus over the years has shifted from kind of classic research to applied research. I like research that you can do something with. I like research that you can actually apply to the world that you live in, to the events that you do, to the activities that you're a part of, and see the change in those activities. So I'm going to talk about interventions for the inclusion of underrepresented groups in the world of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there are a lot of different interventions that are out there that come from the place of well-intentioned people that are completely untested, and not testing interventions can lead to two areas of problems, right? One, they may not work, and two, they may backfire. 
So I'm going to talk about this issue today in several different ways. One is going to be just a quick introduction with an example. So how many of you have ever heard of the technique known as progressive staffing? Right? People don't really hear about it, which is fascinating because it's something that has made the news a couple times in the past five or so years. And it is a technique popularized in the world of group facilitation. So when you have a speaker series, it's the idea of being mindful in your speaker series to have underrepresented voices go early in a speaker series for several reasons. One is that salience, that primacy effect of the first group of speakers tend to be the best remembered in some ways. One is so the voices that need to be represented don't get drowned out in the sea of other voices that are being represented. So it's a mindful way of approaching a speaker series or a set of talks in order to be more inclusive. It's very positive, I can't very positively informed and well intentioned. That idea has been adopted in pedagogy, in teaching, in the classroom. And when a professor or teacher uses it, what that means is that they're trying to be mindful of who is represented in their class speaking up. So the way it typically gets used is the professor or teacher tries to become mindful of who they're calling on in class in the way that they're trying to make sure that classically underrepresented groups are getting their voices heard. And they're doing it in a way that means that the teacher has to practice awareness and self-awareness of who is speaking up, be mindful of who they see as underrepresented groups, and try to call on those people from underrepresented groups first and more often in class. And this comes from a positive place in pedagogy research where we know that we tend to have more white men voices speaking up in classes, even in psychology. I know you sit in your psychology classes and you're like, there's three men here. How can those voices be overrepresented? It still happens even in our psychology classes. So the idea comes from a well-intentioned place to get more voices heard. However, it's up to the professor how they're going to represent this technique. And we end up with a few issues. As intended, I think that it's a helpful idea, and I think that becoming more mindful of who speaks up in your classes is great as a form of better teaching and better awareness. However, the first issue with this is we don't actually know if it works. And that's because there really isn't research out there on this technique. Back the first time it made the news in 2017, I searched the crap out of all my scholarly databases to try to find research showing that there's evidence that this is helpful and makes people feel more included. I couldn't find anything. Found a lot of opinion pieces, lots of opinion pieces, no research. I searched again yesterday as I was getting ready for this talk and as I knew I was going to use this example. Still, more opinion pieces not really researched on it. So issue one is we don't know the effectiveness. Issue number two is based around controversy that can happen with use of this technique, and that's based all around the way it's used. Both times that this technique has made national news has been because a professor has used it overtly on their syllabus and told their students about it on the first day of class in a way that led to a slightly adversarial environment, right? And that's a risk of talking directly about these things that you could lead to an adversarial environment. And I'm not meaning between students and professors, because we know that that tends to kind of be the mindset that we're always fighting against as professors, is trying to make sure that we're collaborative and it doesn't seem adversarial. I mean between students. I don't want to make an environment where I'm putting students who are unrepresented on the spot, feel like they have to speak up, and where I'm telling other students that I'm specifically not going to talk to them to make them feel like they're competing against the other students, right? That could be an uncomfortable environment for them. Secondarily, in the cases of people who have made news most of the time, they violated the rules and standards of their syllabus at their universities and that has led to issues. 
However, I want to say that embodying these values and ideas, taking the technique theoretically into your mindset as you're teaching, that's something that I do, and it's something I think a lot of professors do, and I think it's a positive thing. I just don't know if going about it this way is the right way to do it when you overtly talk about it in class. And one of the reasons I don't know the answer to that question is no one's tested it, right? No one's collected data on either doing it in a more internal way with self-awareness or doing it overtly. So my personal philosophy in the last few years has been that there are many interventions that we use in the education system, in businesses, in the world that are meant to help with representation, that are meant to help with diversity, equity, and inclusion that are not tested, but do not have research behind them. And one of the most famous one, right, is um, implicit bias training. Implicit bias training started being used in businesses, in the police, in schools, long before it was actually tested. And as testing has happened, now we're not so sure it's very effective and we need to reevaluate how we teach it. But we used it for years first. The most famous example is in teaching, and you know, I grew up in the 1980s, so I was a part of this style of teaching, is the idea of teaching the idea of colorblindness, ignoring racial differences, right? And we know from years of research that is a problematic approach that leads to underrepresentation, it leads to a lack of celebration of cultural differences, and a lot of problems. Yet, we used it on tested, well intentioned, on tested intervention for a very long time. So, my philosophy is that we can use interventions, we need to be mindful, and when we can, we can test interventions ourselves. So, I'm going to talk about two of the projects that we're doing right now that exist in the world of testing interventions. I'm going to move relatively quickly so we can. Um, keep on schedule today, but I'm going to talk about each of these just a little bit. I'm going to tell you that both topics I have actually have posters over in the corner that you can check out the data from our recent research on um, before you finish up for today. The first one is on something called the tunnel of oppression. Is anyone familiar with what the tunnel of oppression is? Is anyone ever? <laughs> well, my students are, that's boring <laughs> since you've been working on it. Um, but it is something that's been used across college campuses for quite a few years, almost 30 years of different college campuses doing what they call the tunnel of oppression. And I do warn you that some of the images I show from tunnel of oppression are a bit defensive, and that's the point. The tunnel of oppression is supposed to be a experience you go through to become aware of oppression in the United States. It's mostly aimed at people higher on the privilege ladder, and it's aimed at making them aware of oppression in the U.S. at any given time. So they'll see different videos, they'll see different demonstrations, they'll hear about racial oppression, they'll hear about sexism, they'll hear about homophobia, and different things that are affecting underrepresented groups in the U.S. differentially, right? And the problem is lack of peer-reviewed evidence, right? In 30 years, there has been one unpublished study that I know of that shows the effectiveness of the tunnel of oppression at least raises awareness. It's a dissertation that's not technically published in a peer-reviewed journal, so really, the research isn't even really out there unless you're specifically looking for it. There have been different research studies showing that ideas based around the same ideas as the tunnel of oppression have worked in the past for training purposes, for getting people to be more aware of oppression to do something about it, but not specifically the tunnel itself. And the tunnel varies so much from place to place. Topics. Topics vary wildly from semester to semester, from school to school, and the presentation style varies, right? We typically have done kind of a mixed media presentation where we use different types of printouts, experiences, videos, audio files, etc. But the pandemic happened. We went to an entirely online web-based format based entirely on videos, right? We just switched 
Other universities do this in theater production, where they actually have people act out oppression in the United States, which makes me very nervous as far as how that is representing things turning into a theater production. I'm not so sure if that's the right approach, but it's not tested, so I don't know if it works or not. So I feel like when we're looking at an intervention like this, the first thing that should have happened, what's happening in my lab, is we're looking at why did it work in the first place. And one way is all the research on privilege awareness. The research on privilege awareness is mixed, such that some awareness of privilege in the United States tends to motivate people to make positive changes, become more aware, and generally do good things for their community. It can have positive energy. However, when I first mentioned the child oppression, some of my um, some of my colleagues at the university, the first thing they thought is, what is backlash effects, right? Could you have backlash effects? The privilege research suggests that sometimes people have backlash effects to privilege, to awareness of privilege. And there's two ways to kind of reduce that. One is to carefully make it personal, not instantly make it very personal, but slowly make it personal. And the other one is to give them something to do. The energy that you have after learning about repression is very strong, very emotional. So giving them a recommendation is what can you do to fix things is something that is helpful. I also think we should focus on things. We should, in the type of intervention, never teach color blindness, right? The idea of ignoring group differences is not going to be helpful. We want to make sure celebrating differences and celebrating commonalities in these types of interventions. So my recommendation is that when we build a commonwealth profession, we think about ways to allow people to achieve those ideas of having something to do, of focusing on a multicultural idea, of celebrating cultural differences, and not just highlighting oppression, but also celebrating positive cultural differences. In our current research, we have tested two years worth of the public repression on our campus. We're a smaller campus, we're talking hundreds of participants instead of thousands, and we change our topics every year. As I said, offensive images, this is what we call a wall of hate, very commonly used in the public repression. It's just a wall of hate speech that's supposed to help people become aware of what people have to face every day when they come from a group that is oppressed in the U.S., just casual hate speech. So, in doing this, we have collected data for two years, and as I said, folks are over there to help you see more of it. We are doing pre-tests and post-tests, so we are collecting data before and after the tunnel of oppression, and we want to see if there's a change in awareness and a change in feelings towards outgroups. So we really want prejudice to go down, warmth towards outgroups to go up, and those types of ideas. And I'm just going to skip to the topic slide here and say that our topics have varied from year to year. Back in our first year, which was two years ago, this was the 2020 tunnel, um, we had a focus on general awareness, a focus on LGBTQ youth, and a focus on redlining in Kansas City. And it was in person. And you can see more details on the poster, but I'll just tell you that we found support. I know my wider lines aren't really showing, but we found support that awareness raises, we found support that intentions to reduce prejudice go in the right direction, people become more aware of their privilege and ideas like that, which we have pre tests and the post tests, right? Not the cleanest research in the world, but support is there. So we have good sampling. Most of the people who did the tunnel did fill out the research. We had clean data, promising results that make me think, okay, thank goodness, the tunnel's doing good things. I'm glad we're gonna keep doing it. I'm glad it's there. Um, unfortunately, what happened in that first year is we did the tunnel, two weeks later, we locked it out, right? COVID-19 happened and we locked down. So we couldn't do follow-up. We wanted to do a three-month follow-up and we weren't able to do it. But we have learned that there is some effectiveness, at least to our tunnel, right? This is not going to generalize because people do the tunnel differently in different places. 
Are you a two data, which you can also see? I'm going to tell you to take the chai at grain of salt because the year two data was the first time we ever did it online. We have a hard time getting that second data point after they did the tunnel of depression. And there are still indications of general awareness in groups. So I still feel that we see some positive results that we should be doing the tunnel of depression like we do it, at least, and that it is helpful. But I'm really hoping that year three goes a little more clearly. I'm really excited about year three. Year three started yesterday. And my students and I took an active role in designing the tunnel of depression this year so that we could bring in empirically informed perspectives. So we tried a few things in addition to our traditional tunnel videos. You know, we are focusing on disparities in the pandemic. So we have a video of a man talking about how he lost most of his family to the COVID-19 pandemic, and they didn't have most of the pre-existing conditions that predict dying from COVID-19. They were a black family, and they did not have access to testing as early as others. They do not have access to health care as early as others. They probably couldn't say otherwise. We also have a video that talks about a non-transgender girl living in Texas who was performing suicidal ideation at the age of four because she was being told that she couldn't live as she wished to live. So those types of videos are common in tunnels of impression, right? They build up energy, they build up action. Do they quite get empathy? So we're trying to get people more involved with empathy by having them actually look on their campus. Do we have inclusive resources for bathrooms for trans and non-binary people? You can see through a couple of demonstrations my students wrote that at graduation, in fact, you would have to make an, a 10 to 20 minute long trip in order to use the bathroom if you wanted to use all of uh, all gender inclusive bathrooms. The plus side is we actually have them, most places don't. The minus is that that's a ridiculous chart. And then finally, we're giving people the opportunity to do things after. And that is by showing them things like black owned businesses in Kansas City and LGBTQ owned businesses in Kansas City that they can reach out to after the tunnel of oppression and use that energy. Okay, so I'm told I have five minutes, so I'm going to very quickly mention the second example. And the second example is more universal, right? Surveys. I want to talk about how we can be more inclusive in survey techniques. Years ago, when I was still in grad school, one of my professors pointed out that we had started using inclusive gender items in our surveys on campus. We had gone from just calling gender, male or female, to having people pick male or female or transgender. She was very proud of this. I raised an eyebrow and was a little bit worried about it because not only were we still using sex terms instead of gender, typically we'd be using man and woman instead of male and female, we were also asking people to other themselves. They weren't able to pick transgender and man or transgender and woman, no representation of non-binary identities. This is 2011, so we were already talking about non-binary identities at the time and we weren't including them. And my thought was because gender is being salient so often, and because the data is collected so often, this could actually cause what we call a stereotype among gender minority populations by raising their anxiety levels, by making them aware of the differences, and aware of the fact that people might not think that they can perform well in their gender identity. And I thought that perhaps what we were actually doing was just making this salient more often. And though places are trying inclusive items, one good example is OkCupid. Okay, they let you identify across the gender spectrum. However, they still force you to appear in searches intended for men or women. Right? You can identify. You can identify as your but you still have to show up in one of the other type of searches, which is not the world's most inclusive. And this is an issue because the transgender and non-binary community face violence at very high levels right now, they face different types of legislation that are targeting them specifically, so it can be problematic. So what I did to test this idea is I presented trans and cisgender, or identifying with the gender assigned at birth, participants with one of these two gender items. 
And I found that my trans participants tended to lose collective self-esteem in their gender identity after the three items. That means they can't derive enough as much self-esteem from their gender identity after the presentation of the three item as opposed to the classic measures. And then also that they de-identify from their gender group, which is not healthy for people to de-identify from their gender group. Gender is important to them as part of their core identity. De-identifying isn't a good thing. So what we are doing is we are working on a large study to try to predict where stereotype threat could be, could be affecting performance for these individuals. After this type of reminder, this type of de-identification, what types of changes in behavior on value paradigms are being affected by this? And that's the source of the resource research that I'm going to ask you to look at later on the posters. So I don't have time to talk about it in front of you today. But please check that out later to see what we're doing, because what we want to do is A, inform better collection of gender identity on surveys, and then B, we want to go ahead and predict what could be problematic about not representing these identities and use that to inform inclusion in the future. So, quick take-home message. I think that these ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion are imperative for us. I think that it's very important. I think that interventions are not created equally. I showed you one intervention that actually harms the people. It's supposed to help. I showed you another intervention that does seem to help. It just wasn't tested before. And now it is. So we can test these interventions mindfully and make better decisions about what we should use. And we should be doing that. And I want to say that even as students, even as student researchers, you can get involved in this. I have 10 to 15 students every semester helping me with these projects. And the gender items study, all created by students, right? That whole idea was made by students. The total repression has been designed by students this semester. So I think that you can very much get involved in this type of research if you're interested, and I invite you to do so um, whenever you find your interest area that really motivates you, go for it. All right, that's all I have for now. I want to thank everyone who's worked with me, and thank you so much for your attention. All right. That's amazing. Harry, you want to do some research? Yeah? I know, yeah. I'm like shaking your head, yes. Hey, I'd like to introduce to you another uh, uh, person from, I believe, KU. Am I right, Victor? KU? Her name is Sarah Mathis. Is Sarah Mathis here? There she is. Did I say that? Are you from KU? Park University in the house. Woo! Come on up, Sarah. From Park University.
afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Mathis, and I'm from Park University. Um, today, I am going to uh, present. Okay, so I'm sorry. Um, there's no way to fix that. Thank <laughs> you. 
um, Sarah Mathis from Park University. class project and um, it worked with my overall paper that I did with attachment style in memory. Okay, so technology has provided us with a lot of resources. Um, we can look at um, videos online, we can watch TV, we can type in questions into Google and within seconds get answers to them. The same thing can be said with quizzes. You can look up quizzes online, and you can take a quiz about anything your heart desires. If you type in attachment style quiz or quizzes online to Google, it will yield about 779,000 results. And just as a little background information, attachment style, um, they, it is actually formed within the first few years of your life. And it is shaped by how your parents and your caregivers meet your needs, whether that be physical, mental, or emotional. Um, and individuals may either be securely attached, which means they are more able to trust and be open and rely on others. And insecurely attached individuals actually find this much harder to do. And there are different types of insecurely attached individuals. So for example, anxiously attached they like to be more codependent with others, and avoidant individuals actually prefer to be much more independent and um, closed off. So this leads me to how technology has impacted our access to questionnaires. You can take a questionnaire about um, what attachment style you may have, and it will allow you to reflect on your own experiences, as well as take what you learn to change possibly in the behavior that you have learned about yourself. And I personally, I love learning about attachment style and I love taking quizzes, whether they are be quizzes, or you can it or not, I love quizzes. So I combined quizzes and attachment style to find um, research about how they compare and differ amongst each other. And then I coded four things that I noticed within these questionnaires. So I chose six questionnaires. Um, since it was a school project, I felt six was good enough for my study at the time. And um, they were chosen off of the page that I showed earlier. And um, I completed each of them individually so that I could accurately code for the different elements. And there are five elements that I could put. So I looked at the formatting of questions, um, true, false, or literate scales, then relationship focus, whether the questions ask about platonic, familiar, familial, or romantic relationships. And then um, cons consistent question themes that I noticed included intimacy, dependency, rejection, closeness, and affection. And then I also noticed that some of them included demographic questions, such as your gender or your age, your marital status. And um, I deemed each of these reputable or not, based on whether or not they were written or excerpted from a professional in a field. Okay, so here is my coding sheet. Um, so as you can see over here, Okay. As you can see here, these are all of my quizzes that I looked at, that I took from Google, um, and the response back here shows the true or false and the literate scale, and there's actually only one that utilized the uh, true or false, which is the Gibson one, and as we'll see later on, that one I did deem as a less reputable source. Next we have the focus. Um, and most of them actually, so all of the more reputable sources solely looked at how you interact um, from a romantic uh, perspective. 
and the less reputable use more generalized statements about all of your relationships. So the only two that include the family and friends is um, the Gibson and the attachment project. Now moving on to question types, we have um, the different themes and two of the quizzes had all of the consistent themes in them and that is the web research design and the header one. Um, and then as we move on, the other four, they only lacked one of the elements that I noticed. So the Gibson one, they lacked questions about dependency. So things such as how comfortable they felt depending on others and how they felt whether or not they were reliable to other people. Next we have the Levine and the Psychology Today quizzes. They both lacked questions about affection. So this would include things as how comfortable they felt giving and receiving affection. And the last one here, the attachment project, they included all but rejection questions. So what they do and how they react when they have been rejected by others or how they feel rejecting other people. And then we have the demographic questions and only two of the quizzes I noticed had, had demographic questions. One of them was a more reputable and the other was less. So web research design and the attachment project both included different project questions. And this last one here um, is my reputability and for my study I only noted that two were less reputable and that is just because these two there was no information about whether professionals had wrote them or if they had been taken from a professional or exerted from someone. Well, just a little bit more information that goes beyond what the coding shows you. So reputable quizzes were lengthier in the time, um, and it had more questions, and they were more in depth. And your results were also more in depth and more consistent. And I think one of the reasons why they were more um, lengthier is because they would include multiple questions about one aspect. So instead of having one or two questions about affection, it would be maybe five or six. Then less reputable, they were less shorter, um, and they usually took about five minutes. So the, the consistency was different. Um, when I took the more reputable, they seemed to be much more accurate. What I got on one was more consistent with the other, so I got my result more often than not than with the less reputable quizzes. And something else to note is these less reputable quizzes actually um, ask for your name and email before you can get the results, and I know that can be very annoying. <laughs> so, some key takeaways online questionnaires can be very helpful given the source and if you like taking quizzes, it is a great place for you to learn more about yourself. And it can provide a starting point for you to assess whether or not maybe you want to change your behavior or maybe seek out professional help. Um, according to my research, I feel like not all those reputable sources are bad, as they did include a generalized statement. It was pretty consistent. Um, and this leads me to, there were the similar themes in all of the sources despite the reputability of it. Now obviously if you do a more reputable source you'll get better results, but it, you can still take the less reputable and get a good idea of kind of where you want. And the significance of this study is not all questionnaires are the same, so what you may take on one could be completely different on them. So if I reference back the web research design and the Heller one, they both have all of the consistent themes. But the web research design included demographic questions. Whereas the Heller one, they had all the themes, but they didn't include demographic questions. So each of the quizzes had their own unique way of approaching how to assess what attachment style you had. 
Now, some critiques. Um, my sample was pretty small, and as we saw earlier, there are so many more questionnaires that can be examined, and this can affect the results. Um, it could have made it completely a different aspect of what I would have looked at. So um, this next point is I may have had to examine other elements. So instead of maybe examining whether or not they had demographic questions, I could have examined whether or not um, they had ads or not, or where these professionals completed their work. There's so many different things that you can include when doing research like this, looking at different questionnaires to see how it is unique to them. And then my references are after this, but does anyone have any questions? Um, do you have any reliability on your scoring? Secondary reliability, like the right three letters, and they include as well. No, um, since it was a class of finding, I kind of just, I did it all by myself. Um, like I said, you could do it again, and what you deem as, I guess, what you decide to focus on could be completely different than what I focus on. So, there's so many different things that could have been like that. There's many elements, but those were just the ones that I kind of pointed out. Yes? Did you look at the feedback that these different surveys gave? Like when they actually said the piece of the after they took it? Like how they talked about the results, essentially? Yeah, so the more reputable ones, they actually gave a more in depth explanation of what your results would be. Um, and um, the most, the one that I deemed the best out of them is the web research design because it actually gave a little uh, graph and it placed each of the different types of attachment style and where you were plotted in that diagram. So then it would explain exactly what that meant and um, depending on the source, um, some go more in depth, but it gave you the general idea of like, hey, this is kind of like which these types of individuals struggle with and whatnot, so. So those that do put you in one of the groups and tell you which one you said it. Yeah, so they all do group you into one. Um, the less reputable ones, they're just, they don't give as much detail as like to whatever you got for your results. Thank you so much. Yes? Did you get different results depending on the reputability of the quizzes? Or were they just about the same? Um, it was pretty much the same. I mean, like I said, you can examine different um, themes, but the ones that I looked at, they were all pretty much across each of them. Um, a couple of them were lacking a few of the themes, um, but other than that, they mostly had everything. Okay. Um, if there's no more questions, I would just like to say thank you guys for listening to my presentation. Thank you, uh, Sarah, for your presentation. I'd like to um, and so welcome. We have one another uh, board of trustee member here, Brad Isnard. Trustee Isnard, are you still here? He was here earlier. Just want to make sure we acknowledge him. I don't know where he Okay. Well, he was here earlier. All right. So now we're going to um, hear a little bit from uh, one of our. Uh, uh, she's in charge, the director of our learning commons here on campus. Um, and we're going to welcome Dr. Amanda Williams. All right. So excited to be here this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Hammonds, for inviting me um, to be part of this really special day. Um, as Andrika said, my name is Dr. Amanda Williams, and I oversee our library and learning services departments here at KCKCC. Um, I also am a member of our adjunct faculty, so teach courses in our psychology and honors education programs. 
So today, I'm going to share my thoughts about undergraduate research, some comments, how research has helped me on my journey, as, how, as well as how I hope it will help you on yours, okay? Um, so to start out with, I'd like some interaction. So if you would turn to your neighbor, and please tell them something you have gained from attending today. So the one I want to share with you this morning is the circles all around us. And in this story, we learn how we can create bigger and bigger circles of community and connections as we grow. So I'm going to attempt to balance the microphone and turn pages, okay? So we begin by drawing a circle on the ground along each shoe. A safe little place for just one person, nobody in this circle but you. You can keep that circle closed to everyone but yourself. But that would be like a library with just one book on the shelf. So let's draw a bigger circle for you and your family to share. Now you see what all can happen in a circle full of care. It becomes a happier circle as more loved ones come to stay. And wouldn't it be even better if all your friends could come and play? So you stretch and draw your circle even bigger than it's been, and let a few more people know they're welcome to come in. And the circles all around us, everywhere that we all go, there's a difference we can make and a love we can all show. Yet there are still so many outside the circle who are different in all they do, though it feels slightly uncomfortable. We draw a bigger circle for them too. It doesn't mean the circle is easy. It can get harder the more we share. But wonderful things can happen when love is known and felt everywhere. As time passes, our eyes open, we see others we really care for. And that's when we ask ourselves, well, what's the circle really there for? So let us create bigger circles all around us for the rest of our days. Let our caring ripple out in a million little ways there's a difference we can make and a love we can all show as our circles grow and grow and we watch them wander eyed. Remember the first circle started with just the love you hold inside. And that author dedicated that book for all the kids making the world better right where they are. And those words echo how I feel about undergraduate research and those of you that are using your skills and abilities to analyze, expand your reasoning, and contribute your knowledge to your peers and your community. It was very awesome to see the interaction here today as you were doing your poster presentations and as we had presenters come in. According to the American Association of Community Colleges, undergraduate research experiences use the scientific method and or engineering design process to promote student learning by investigating a problem where the solution is unknown to students or faculty. These research experiences provide students with essential work for, workforce and lifelong learning skills, such as collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking, creative thinking, and communication. Examples of research experiences in community colleges include course-based research, which many of you are doing, right? Um, the mentored research as part of a larger project, 
student-centered research, such as independent studies and honors projects, employer-based research, such as internships, and STEM design challenges and competitions. In your lives, there will be many opportunities. However, like Cheryl Sandberg said, opportunities are rarely offered. They're seized. It will be up to you to capitalize on the opportunities on your journey. My undergraduate research journey began when I was studying psychology at Pittsburgh State University. My advisor, Dr. Julie Allison, provided me the opportunity to participate in a research study gathering sexual assault data from a community organization. My academics and that research experience and having Dr. Allison as someone to provide a reference for me later was a great asset when I applied to graduate school and later when I sought out an internship for Moxa. Each step in my education and career, I have looked for opportunities to use my knowledge and experience. My circles have continued to grow. And today, I get to mentor and encourage students that are working on their own research. The research that you do translates into love. Each step you take is building your circle bigger and bigger. And we need to think about all those circles just even today and the things that you have learned. Take a moment and think about how those circles have made an impact on your life. At this moment, you have drawn so many circles that you are now in a room full of other students like yourself that have participated in undergraduate research. Those circles around you include your own personal development, an established relationship with a professor or mentor to guide you. You have now explored potential career opportunities through your research. You've expanded your resume and your public speaking skills. You prefer, pre uh, prepare yourself for further studies, okay? Um, and your research contributes to and impacts your community. I would like to reiterate author Rad Montague's words. In the circles all around us, everywhere that we all go, we can make and love. Oh, excuse me, there's a difference we can make and a love we can show. Thank you for giving me a few moments to share my experience with undergraduate research and talk through how we are using research at the community college level. And it has been so awesome to see those of you from the university also come in as we see that progression. Um, and so that has been very, very awesome. And I don't ever like to end anything without giving something away. Um, and so I am hoping Elizabeth Golden, if I said that correctly, from KU Edwards is here. She is not here. Okay, I'm going to give this to you. And if you would, can you get that to her for me? Okay, awesome. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> She just really want to be a researcher, right? I mean, this is like motivational. Like, where am I going to be in the next couple years? What am I going to be doing? Man. Awesome. Well, hey, um, I wanted to share a couple things real quick um, as we get ready to close. All this uh, information, does it make you hungry? Yes. Okay, so um, everyone who came should have received an amazing t shirt. Yeah. Yep, Psi Beta. Um, uh, it's a club here on campus. That was uh, started by uh, Victor Ammons. And um, if you're interested in doing more of this, learning more, going to their schools and learning more, Victor's the guy to see. Um, so uh, join at his club because he needs all the help he can get, right? Right. Yes, right, Victor. Yes. Um, all right. And then um, if you are a Monday, Wednesday, Friday student, Victor would like for you to wear your shirt to class. Yes. We have a picture. Okay, this is like a whole cool moment right here. Okay, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes and or Tuesday, Thursday classes, right? Wear your class on Thursday. So tomorrow, you guys wear your, your shirts, and on Thursday, you guys wear your shirts. Okay? All right, you gotta support the shirts, right? Yes. Okay. All right, so hey, why don't we give a roll, uh, just uh, some snaps? Let's give some snaps to all of our student presenters here, some snaps. All of our, um, our keynote speaker, all of the oral presentations that we're giving. Oh, I'm giving some snaps. Yeah, this is some hard work, I'm telling you. Um, for doing this, all of our faculty here at KCKCC give us some snaps, right? 
because they work hard for you to see you do it to get to the next level and be your best, right? Be your best. Don't forget your foundation of where you came from right here, right? Okay, we're, we're going to help you get to the next level and even beyond because I think we've had some uh, alum students from the other universities that started here that are poster pre presenters and as well as oral, okay? So please um, don't forget us, okay? Come back to give back, right? Yeah, that's what we do. All right, Miss Dr. Stacy, I'm going to call you Miss Dr. Stacy Tucker. Come on up. We have some um, amazing uh, recognition that we want to give to our students here. And so um, we're going to call their names. You guys keep snapping, okay? Because we've got these cool certificates that we're going to give to our, uh, you guys for participating. Um, and FYI, you know, uh, we had some people, we had some secret shoppers in the room today. Do you guys know that? And so they were looking at your presentations, on their poster presentations, and you're going to probably be hearing something later. So you never know who's in the crowd, right? Right. Okay, here we go. When I call your name, come on up because we want to recognize you for your hard work um, and uh, just being a student here at KCK, just, you know, what you're going to do at the next level, okay? We want to just make sure we acknowledge that now. We're going to say it now before it happens, right? Yeah. All right. Nathaniel Lane, come on up, Nathaniel. Yeah. Congratulations. Hard work pays off. Rose Schmidt. Come on up, Rose. Let's see, 
Courtney Zool. scholarships for um, applications to universities so that you can see for it up to go away is that what you guys can see you know they can say that you had experience in doing this but dr Tucker, would you close this out just a couple of versions absolutely so um i'm just going to give you my little story um, i work in the honors program i do undergraduate research and service for me and i do i think a capo so i became a doctor in 2014 I was told as a young child I was not graduating from high school. So anything negative in your life, push that away. Keep going because whatever your dream is, it can be accomplished if you just push it away. So thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate all of you that are in the room. And I believe Andrea is at our lunch now. So I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch. So please have a good day. <laughs> All right, come on over right through these doors so you can get your lunch. Um, but if you want to chat with anyone in the post presentation or any of our uh, oral presenters, please take some time to talk to them. Come talk to the colleges that are right over here on the side and get uh, some information. Thank you.